Previously, host Hal Holbrook and guest experts revealed the story of the biblical Sabbath from the beginning of human time. Originally established as the pivot point of the weekly cycle, the seventh day stood for thousands of years as the seal of the Creator's power and authority. The Ten Commandments, bedrock principles for human life, elevated the seventh-day Sabbath to the level of divine decree. During the lifetime of Jesus Christ, contention and debate raged over the issue of proper Sabbath-keeping. The Jewish way of Sabbath-keeping was very legalistic. You couldn't move, you couldn't do anything. By healing the man with the withered hand, Jesus showed the true spirit of the Sabbath. He rejected the rabbi's rules. He kept the Sabbath as taught in the ancient Hebrew scriptures. Jesus did not break the Sabbath of the Ten Commandments. What he did was to defy human laws and traditions. So where and when did Christians first begin to observe an alternate day of worship? The first law requiring people to celebrate on Sunday and rest on Sunday was uh, a law promulgated by the Emperor Constantine in the year 321. In spite of the popularity of sun worship and the Sunday laws of emperors, many Christians continued to worship on the seventh-day Sabbath. In fact, Christian churches that abandoned the Sabbath were in the minority. And now we continue the story of the Sabbath controversy in part three of the seventh day. Revelations from the Lost Pages of History. I am Patrick, a sinner most unlearned, the least of all the faithful, and utterly despised by many. My father was Calpomius, a deacon, son of Patitius, a priest of the village of Banavum Tabernia. He had a country seat nearby, and there I was taken captive. I was then about 16 years of age. I did not know the true God. I was taken into captivity to Ireland with many thousands of people, and deservedly so, because we turned away from God and did not keep his commandments. This is a copy of St. Patrick's Confession, the testimony of a man who is often considered the most famous Irishman of all time. But myths and legends often obscure his true identity. Was he a great miracle-working missionary to Ireland? Was he the one who chased the snakes off the Emerald Isle? Who was he, really? Welcome to part three of the seventh day, revelations from the lost pages of history. I'm Hal Holbrook. We're about to see the St. Patrick of history, quite a different man from the Patrick of legend and tradition. And we'll soon go on to uncover more about the long drawn out effort to replace the biblical Sabbath with Sunday as a universal Christian day of worship. Patrick was born in late fourth century Scotland into a Celtic Christian culture. His religion was quite different from the Latin or Roman Christianity that was taking over in other parts of Western Europe. We don't really know who the first Celtic Christians were. We don't seem to know who brought Christianity to them. We're not even certain when all of that began. But what we do know is what they believed, based on the writings of Patrick and the others. And we know that what they believed was based on their understanding of Scripture. Unlike the theologians of Roman Christianity, who appealed more and more to the teachings of church and councils, Celtic teachers stressed the Bible. This loyalty to the Bible is what separated the Celtic Christians from the much larger Roman Christian community. Because the Bible was the foundation of their faith, 
it was difficult for them to accept the authority of the Roman church. You see, the Celtic church grew up beyond the reach of Roman influence. It was rooted in the Sabbath-keeping church that began with Jesus and his apostles back in the first century. The background from which the Celtic Christians received their Christianity indicates to us that they were strong believers in what the scriptures said. They wanted to do what the Bible told them to do. That same background indicates for us that they got their Christianity before Sunday keeping uh, came into vogue. There is nothing in Patrick's works which indicates his acceptance of the teachings of church fathers. He appealed solely to the scriptures in support of what he believed, practiced, and propagated. So this was Patrick's religion, based on the Bible, faithful to its teachings, and obedient to its commandments. This was the religion he was destined to carry to the Irish. Kidnapped by raiders, Patrick and thousands of others found themselves carried off to Ireland to be sold like so much livestock. There he spent six long years working for a farmer as a slave. Every day I had to tend sheep, and many times a day I prayed. The love of God and his fear came to me more and more, and my faith was strengthened. And this even when I was staying in the woods and on the mountains. And I used to get up for prayer before daylight, through snow, through frost, through rain. And there one night I heard in my sleep a voice saying to me, Soon you will go to your own country. And again after a short while I heard the voice saying to me, See, your ship is ready. And it was not near, but at a distance of perhaps 200 miles. And I had never been there, nor did I know a living soul there. And then I took to flight. And I left the man with whom I had stayed for six years. And I went in the strength of God, who directed my way to my good. And I feared nothing until I came to that ship. Patrick always believed that his escape from Ireland was directed by a divine hand. His own people received him back with the plea that he never leave them again. But God's plan for Patrick's life was not to be carried out in his homeland. I saw in the night the vision of a man whose name was Victoricus coming, as it were, from Ireland with countless letters. And he gave me one of them. And I read the opening words of the letter, which were the voice of the Irish. And as I read the beginning of the letter, I thought that at the same moment I heard their voice, and thus did they cry out as with one mouth, We ask thee, boy, come and walk among us once more. Responding to the voices of the Irish people, Patrick went back to Ireland. There his career as a preacher and teacher eventually earned him the title of saint and placed him in the ranks of the world's best known Christian missionaries. But something that isn't so well known about him is this. Saint Patrick kept the seventh day Sabbath. In fact, his Sabbath keeping became legendary. Two centuries after his death, his biographer wrote that every seventh day, Patrick and his friend Victoricus met together for prayer and fellowship. Some historians even think that Patrick's special Sabbath day friend was actually an angel. We really don't have to rely solely on the writings or experience of Patrick to understand the history of keeping the seventh day in Ireland. After all, ancient Irish laws governed the history of the Irish tribes for many years, and those laws stipulated that the people were to, among other things, keep the seventh day Sabbath. 
It seems to have been customary in the Celtic churches of early times to keep Saturday, the Jewish Sabbath, as a day of rest from labor. They obeyed the fourth commandment literally upon the seventh day of the week. As the influence of the Roman religion increased, it gradually affected the Sabbath practice of some Celtic Christians in the British Isles. By the early 6th century, it was not unusual for Celtic believers to keep both Saturday and Sunday as holy days. That's how it was during the lifetime of Patrick's spiritual successor, an Irishman named Columba. He was a graduate of one of the schools established by Patrick. Born about 521 into a noble family, he gave up his right to the throne of Ireland and dedicated himself to a higher calling. Columba based his missionary enterprise on the rocky island of Iona. He and 12 friends reached that remote post by sailing from the west coast of Scotland in small, round boats made of animal skin. There on Iona, Columba founded a training school for missionaries who carried the Christian message to the Scottish mainland and all over Britain. In doctrine, Columba was true to his Celtic Christian roots. He kept Saturday, the seventh day, as the Sabbath, while Sunday was observed in honor of the resurrection of Christ. Columba taught his disciples to keep the Sabbath as equally sacred. His teachings regarding the observance of the Sabbath was that his followers would go out to the edges of the island of Iona meditate upon creation and the things of God and read the scriptures and become spiritually charged up on that holy day. Columba and his fellow missionaries firmly planted the Christian religion in Scotland. Their converts resisted the growing influence of Rome, which promoted Sunday as the day of worship. Columba died in 597, but his beliefs lived on for hundreds of years in the religion of the Scots. In 1070, Malcolm, King of Scotland, married Margaret, a young woman who was destined to become more famous than her husband. She made her mark in history primarily as a religious reformer. In fact, she was later sainted by the Roman Catholic Church. We know that Queen Margaret grew up at the very pious court of the kings of Hungary, and then from about the age of seven or eight, she was living at the court of Edward the Confessor of England, which was also a very pious, devoutly Catholic court. At the English court, Margaret lived under the influence of the Benedictine monks from Canterbury. When political conditions made her family unwelcome in England, they moved to Scotland, where Margaret caught the eye of the king. Margaret herself uh, seems to have contemplated becoming a nun. There is an account of how unwilling she was to marry Malcolm, King of Scots, because she had wanted to dedicate herself to be, as she termed it, a bride of Christ. Margaret's biographer does tell us that in her early life, she was very devoted to the church, uh, and she was interested in becoming a religious. But when she came to Scotland and she met uh, Malcolm, her future husband, he asked for her hand in marriage. And according to her biography, she wasn't willing, but she consented because her family requested it, and also because she believed that God was thereby giving her an opportunity to carry out his work in the Kingdom of Scotland. Margaret found the Scottish court somewhat crude and unrefined. So she set about to change all that. She was appalled at the way folks in Scotland practiced their religion. Many still followed the doctrines and traditions brought by Columba from Ireland nearly five centuries earlier. There was one aspect of the people's religion that particularly upset the new queen. When Margaret first came to Scotland, she was dissatisfied with Sunday observance as she found it. She found that lay people tended to carry on their menial labors on Sunday. They may have gone to church first, but thereafter uh, they went about their ordinary everyday tasks. And this was something she tried to prevent. 
the Queen insisted upon the single and strict observance of the Lord's Day, Sunday. People and clergy alike submitted, but without entirely giving up their reverence for Saturday. The history of the early Christian centuries reveals a definite anti-Seventh-day Sabbath pro-Sunday movement. And church documents unmistakably identify the religious establishment at Rome as its nerve center. The Roman drive to replace the Seventh-day Sabbath with Sunday got a big boost back in 321 AD. That's the year Constantine ordered state-authorized Sunday observance. Oddly enough, in spite of his professed Christianity, there was very little Christian about his first Sunday law. In fact, it sounds a lot like a call to pagan sun worship. On the venerable day of the sun, let the magistrates and people residing in cities rest, and let all workshops be closed. With a sympathetic emperor on the throne, the leaders of the Roman church gained power and influence. In their councils, they took bold steps to enforce Sunday observance and to urge desecration of the biblical Sabbath. Some of their actions took on a definite anti-Jewish flavor. Christians must not Judaize by resting on the Sabbath, but must work on that day, rather honoring the Lord's Day, Sunday, and if they can, resting then as Christians. But if any shall be found to be Judaizers, let them be anathema from Christ. These pronouncements against Judaizers referred to those who, like the Jews, refused to work on the Sabbath. Christians who did this were to be excommunicated, kicked out of the church. This extreme position against the Sabbath combined with a strong pro-Sunday stance, became a pillar of Roman Catholic teaching. The Sabbath to Sunday change became a mark of Roman Catholic or papal authority. In 602, Pope Gregory identified Sabbath keepers with the Antichrist. He called them Judaizers because of their determination to observe the seventh day as a day for rest and worship. It has come to my ears that certain men of perverse spirit have sown among you some things that are wrong and opposed to the holy faith, so as to forbid any work done on the Sabbath day. Christians in the Italian city of Milan dared to openly observe the Sabbath no matter what the leadership in Rome wanted. The Church of Milan followed the churches of the East. It seems the Saturday was held in a fair esteem. They the churches of the East, came together on the Sabbath day to worship Jesus Christ, the Lord of the Sabbath. Over the centuries, the attempt to establish Sunday as a substitute for the biblical Sabbath was probably only mildly successful. But the campaign was really intensified with a move that threatened to drive a deep wedge between the Eastern and Western branches of Christianity. This move involved a direct assault on the very nature and purpose of Sabbath observance. What was this direct assault? It was a rule forbidding Christians to eat on the seventh day. In other words, a Sabbath fast. This was an anti-Jewish idea that probably originated with Marcion, a heretic who was kicked out of the church back in the second century. Marcion wanted to discredit the Sabbath because it was an image of creation. For him, creation was an evil deed of an evil God, the God of the Old Testament. He distinguished the God of the Old Testament from the God of the New, the God of love. But the church rejected this uh, because creation was a good deed, and the God of the Old Testament is the same with the God of the New. So he turned a celebratory day into a day of lament. And that was his intention. This is why he introduced the Sabbath fast. In spite of its action against him, the church salvaged his fast idea and used it to make the seventh-day Sabbath unappealing. 
Now, this was uh, absolutely contrary to what had been taught in Judaism. In Judaism, Sabbath was a day of feasting. In fact, to fast on the Sabbath meant to break the Sabbath. And so this was another way of distancing Christianity from Judaism. Turning the Sabbath day into a day without food was a very effective strategy, especially since the sixth day, Friday, was also a day of fasting for many believers. In a single generation, young Christians grew up with a built-in dislike for the Sabbath, the day of fasting and gloom, and with a corresponding attraction to Sunday, the day of celebration and feasting. It was the church in Rome that championed uh, the fasting on Sabbath and the feasting on Sunday. In fact, in the fourth century, Pope Sylvester said that uh, it was good to do this in contempt of the Jews. If every Sunday is to be observed joyfully by the Christians on account of the resurrection, then every Sabbath on account of the burial is to be regarded in execration of the Jews. In other words, Christians were told to fast on the Sabbath as an expression of their contempt for the Jews, even as an acted out curse against them. But even this particular anti-Sabbath strategy was only partly successful. Prominent church leaders opposed it. Hippolytus, a third century bishop, felt it was a big mistake. Even today, some order fasting on the Sabbath, of which Christ has not spoken, dishonoring even the gospel of Christ. There is even a report that Augustine, one of the most influential of the Roman church fathers, came to the defense of church members who ignored the Sabbath fast. The leaders in Rome were eventually successful in imposing the Sabbath fast on their followers in the Western world of Christianity. But the same could not be said for what happened in the East. Where the Orthodox influence was strongest, Eastern Christianity resisted this, and their views on the Sabbath were really quite different. Sabbath fasting does not make any sense uh, for the Orthodox because the Sabbath is the day that marks two great events, the completion of creation and the completion of redemption. So Sabbath is a day of double celebration and could never be associated with fasting and lament. <laughs> 